to call the April 15th, 2024 plan commission meeting to order. First item of business, roll call please. Commissioner Jackson. Here. Commissioner Williams. Here. Commissioner Knox. Here. Commissioner Weber. Here. Commissioner Vosco. Commissioner Udell. Here. And Commissioner Markline. Here. Here. Six members present, we have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, item number two, approval of minutes falls under the consent. Unless seeing otherwise, we will consider that approved. So approved. Item number three, approval of final plats and certified survey maps and easement releases also falls under consent. There's nothing to review tonight. Item number four, set for public hearing. Item number one, set for public hearing, conditional use permit to construct a drive through auto service facility, Valvoline Instant Oil Change at 1950 Humes Road, set for public hearing on May 6th, 2024. Item number two, set for public hearing, conditional use permit to construct a microbrewery, O'Reilly and Conway's Brew House at 214 West Milwaukee Street, set for public hearing on May 6th, 2024. And item number three, set for public hearing, conditional use permit to construct a two-family dwelling at 430 South Arch Street, also set for public hearing on May 6th, 2024. Moving on to item number five, old business. We're gonna make one change to it here. We're gonna use item number three first. We're gonna have a public hearing on action on a resolution adopting the 2024-2029 park and open space plan as a component of the city's comprehensive plan. Plan commission resolution number 2024-02. Uh, Mr. Schrader, you, cheers. is Jennifer Schroeder. I'm a full-time operator in the Parks Department and I've been afforded the opportunity to work part-time in the Planning Department the last two winters. The main focus during this time has been collaborating with the Park and Planning staff to complete the draft update to the City's Park and Open Space Plan. The Park and Open Space Plan is an element of the 2023 update. The City's comprehensive plan and must be updated every five years in order to remain eligible for a variety of grant funding opportunities. This includes matching grant funds to the Federal, Law, Federal Land and Water Conservation Fund and the State of Wisconsin Stewardship Fund. The primary purpose of the Park and Open Space Plan is to proactively account for and anticipate the city's future park and recreation needs. Janesville has the distinction of being known as Wisconsin's Park Place. Our extensive and well-maintained park and trail system is derived from a history deeply rooted in strategic planning and support for the acquisition and development of public park and open space lands. The basic plan structure involves taking inventory of the existing facilities, recognizing the completed development projects since and made possible by the previous park and open space plan. The plan concludes with recommendations for further acquisition, maintenance and development, as well as specific planned projects that will be completed in the next five years. The city has six categories of park and open space in addition to its multi-use trail system. First neighborhood parks are the smallest, usually six to 12 acres in size and are primarily designed for use by children within the half mile of the park. They're often characterized by playgrounds, active recreation, and open green space for passive recreation. Some examples of neighborhood parks would be Hawthorne Park, Fourth Ward Park, and Burbank Park. Janesville currently has 115 acres of neighborhood park land. Public elementary school recreation areas currently provide 83 additional recreational spaces and can serve as neighborhood parks in some areas. Next, community parks provide recreational facilities for both children and adults. These parks are usually 25 to 50 acres in size and include all the facilities presented in neighborhood parks, plus additional facilities such as picnic areas, open shelters, and restrooms. Janesville has 249 acres of community park land, and some examples of community parks would be Kiwanis Park, Lustig Park, and Traxler Park. <clears throat> the largest parks are in the regional park category. Regional Park is at least 75 acres in size, includes all the amenities of neighborhood and community parks, but meets the active and passive recreational needs of the entire community. The city currently has 618 acres of regional park land, and some examples of regional parks in the area are Palmer Park, Schaefer Park, and Riverside Park. Special use facilities are also identified under the Park and Open Space Classification System. These are areas of specialized or single purpose recreation such as golf courses, nature centers, and ice arenas. The city currently offers 858 acres of special use facilities. 
Some examples of these facilities would be the Robert O. Cook Memorial Arboretum, the Youth Sports Complex, and Rotary Gardens. Important to note that even though these facilities provide recreation, educational, and green space, they're not included in the calculations of parkland available to residents. They're in addition to the parkland included in meeting our local standards. Additionally, the city of Janesville provides over 800 acres of natural areas, open space, and green belts. Examples of open space areas can vary, but include uh, those lands that accommodate passive or active special recreation activities. They may be areas of environmental significance, including bodies of water, drainage ways, stormwater ma management basins, wildlife habitats, or prairie restoration areas. The final category is the city's multi-use trail system. Multi-use trails accommodate a variety of users from bikers to walkers and more. They're two-way facilities that physically separate users from motor vehicle traffic, normally by utilizing open space as a buffer. They're typically 10 feet wide and paved, and the city currently provides approximately 33 miles of off-road paved trails, and it's one of the city's most used recreational amenities. Overall, the inventory analysis reveals that the city of Janesville provides sufficient regional and neighborhood parkland to meet the city's existing needs and remains well positioned to accommodate future demand. The city's total number of acres continues to exceed standards and at over 41 acres per thousand population, it offers more parkland to residents than any other Wisconsin peer city. The plan continues on to recognize how the 2016 update laid the framework for development and expansion activities that have been completed in the last seven years. Here are some of the projects of note. Palmer Park has had multiple renovation and redevelopment projects completed. This includes Camden Playground. Uh, that renovation removed and replaced the CCA treated, that's copper, coronium, arsenate, uh, wooden play structures uh, with a playground uh, replaced it with a playground made of thermoform plastic materials built on a rubberized surface base. The play area provides an additional 70,000 square feet of open space, a separate age appropriate area for younger children, and a liberty swing for wheelchairs. Summer 2022, 11 stretch out stress exercise and stretching stations were installed along the Mohawk Drive portion of the bike trail near Palmer. It was supported and funded by the Leadership Development Academy and the Rock Trail Coalition. The city has also partnered with the Janesville Velo Club to develop a designated mountain bike course and riding track south of Palmer Drive along Spring Book in 2023. At Riverside Park, six pickleball courts named the <coughs> Jim Clark Memorial Pickleball Courts were constructed in 2018 and six full-size shuffleboard courts were restored in 2020 as interest in both recreational activities has substantially increased. In 2018, the Monterey Dam was removed. Restoration plans are focused on returning Monterey Park and the water space to natural pre-dam conditions. Change in water depth, flow, and condition has seen the return and increase of various wildlife. Shoreline re rehabilitation and the reconfiguring of Monterey Bay has achieved stormwater management goals and allowed for additional trail connections, wildlife habitat improvements, and improved river access points. 2019, Northeast Regional Park was renamed Schaefer Park after former city of Janesville, man uh, former Janesville city manager, Steve Schaefer. A portion of the Ice Age Trail was extended and paved through the western edge of the park, and that connected East Rotomer Road with the existing trail connections at Sand Hill Drive. A small parking lot was also added along Huntington Avenue. Between 2015 and 2022, substantial projects were completed to create Festival Street and the Town Square centralized public gathering space specifically dedicated to fostering a stronger sense of community and a place where commerce, culture, entertainment, and history converge. This town square provides rentable pavilions, great lawn, a water feature floating dock, overlooks, art installations, parking area, outdoor fire pit, and an outdoor fitness court south of the town square next to the downtown transfer station. Festival Street borders the west side of the town square and utilizes bollards at roadway entrances to redirect traffic and create a safe gathering space for community events. A substantial trail project note involves the Peace Trail. In 2022, a collaboration between the City of Janesville, Rock County, Wisconsin DNR, American Transmission Company, and the Rock Trail Coalition made it possible for the crushed limestone trail from Trip Road to Big Hill Park in Beloit to be paved. This connected the cities of Janesville and Beloit and created a new and complete connection to two other substantial trail systems, the Ice Age Trail 
to the north and the Illinois trail system headed south. Final large project to note is the Women's Sports Convention Center, a new specialized use facility being constructed adjacent to Uptown Janesville Mall along Milton Avenue. This facility will contain a main area with a single year-round sheet of ice, a multi multi-purpose arena with adjustable sports space and a convention space. This project is currently in the demolition phase. Final section of the plan addresses recommendations for the future acquisition maintenance and development within the park system. These recommendations are a combination of specific planned projects, general suggestions for improvement that will better be better refined as feasibility and funding allow, and agreed upon objectives for future growth. The plans recommendations continue to emphasize the importance of riverfront property acquisition where appropriate, completion of remaining multipurpose trail sections for increased continuity and park specific maintenance and renewal activities. This map shows approximate locations for future city parks over the next 10 years. More, price, no more precisely, or more precise park boundaries will be determined when lands are acquired or platted and during the preparation of detailed neighborhood plans. Specific future development projects include the expansion of the mountain bike trails at Palmer Park, including a riding track that is expected to be completed in 2024, and eventually the completion of the West Flow Loop and the skills area. Another future park or future project is the redevelopment of the Palmer Wading Pool. The city will utilize the aquatics facilities technical evaluation from architecture and planning to address the current condition of the Palmer Wading Pool, mechanicals, and associated buildings. The city has determined that the current structure will need to be replaced and has entered the early stages of redevelopment. Construction phase will begin after the 2024 summer season. The removal of the Monterey Dam and completion of shoreline restoration projects has allowed for a Monterey Park repurposing project. City staff consulted with architecture and planning to develop initial concepts to be reviewed and adjusted to best fit the community needs. The Park and Recreation Advisory Committee agreed that the focus should be on a combination of reclaiming open green space, as well as considering restroom facilities, gathering spaces, and sports courts or fields. The city will complete the design and planning process in order to begin the repurposing of this space. Additional park and open space projects that will be added in the next five years will focus on continuing to provide the current quality of maintenance and a high level of service, expanding and completing connections of our extensive multi-use trail system, protecting and incorporating the Rock River as a vital natural resource, preserving environmentally sensitive areas, and meeting the park and open space needs of a growing and changing community. Following the public hearing, the Planning and Parks Division recommends that the Plan Commission adopt the 2024 update to the Park and Open Space Plan as a component of the City's comprehensive plan and forward a favorable recommendation to the City Council as provided in Resolution Number 2024-02. Staff in attendance will be happy to answer any questions you might have this time, which includes Park Director Cullen Slapek, who is here this evening. Thank you. Uh, Commission members, any questions for staff? Uh, Commissioner Williams? One of the uh, things that was recommended as far as impact fees go, is that something that the City Council or the Planning Commission is going to be working on, looking at how we use those fees and if we need to change what we're doing now? Um, good question. Impact fees, at least uh, as they would apply to a collection of dollars to promote or further improve acquisition and development of parks and recreation can occur in, in two manners. Under the, the current process, the city applies a, um, a monies in lieu of or actual land dedication during the land development process, specifically under the subdivision ordinance. In other instances, state statutes allow for the local adoption of a special assessment ordinance that could apply uh, to uh, parks and recreation, and that is defined um, uh, under a process by statute. And they both accomplish the, uh, really are intended to accomplish the same goal. The, the city years ago made a, a decision to continue to utilize the existing practice that we have, which is, is likewise uh, legally permissible under law. The, uh, I think the distinction between the two, so no, we're not currently looking at it. We did do a study several years ago and decided to uh, maintain the system that we have. 
But if we were to adopt the uh, special assessment, uh, a special assessment ordinance and practice under state statute, that specifically defines um, where and how monies are collected and the time frame with itch, within which and the specific area within which the city would have to apply uh, those funds within a, a designated time frame. So there are differences between the two. Uh, we haven't looked at that as part of this uh, parks and open space plan update. It has been uh, reviewed in the past and um, I guess what I would say is there, there are distinct differences in the application of those, those practices. have way more parks and open space than any of our pure cities so I'm just wondering you know when we stop taking more parkland and taking some money to maintain the existing yeah the um, well as we all know Janesville is Wisconsin's park place mm -hmm. and um, we have the you know the distinction of having a incredible system um, that includes not only uh, uh, a variety of park types, but special recreational facilities and natural areas. And um, the, the city's long history in, in being proactive in planning for the acquisition of some of these environmentally sensitive areas is largely responsible for why that number um, is as high as it, as it is at, I think, just over 2,600 acres. The, you know, a good amount of that is devoted to those areas that serve multiple purposes, not exclusively for parks or recreation um, in the, by way of green belts, uh, certainly, that, that are multifunctional and only relatively recently speaking have we extended trails through them. But that, that does um, inflate if you will, the, uh, the total amount of uh, acreage devoted to parks and recreation. And then perhaps uh, the parks director could speak to ongoing maintenance uh, of those different types of facilities within, within the system. But there certainly is a distinction between the amount of um, maintenance uh, um, requirement and costs associated with some of those natural areas versus active recreational facilities. As far as I see in here, the to redo of, of Rockport Park, which I'm assuming the structure with the TP and and that is that part of was that that's part of the plan. Sorry, can you repeat that? The uh, part of this said uh, that we were going to rebuild Rockport Park, and is that structure include does that include the structure with the TP and and all? Of it? Correct. The, the strategic plan uh, that the city has is <clears throat> um, right now the Peace Park Playground is slated for a 2026 remodel, such just kind of the same as what uh, Camden Playground was. So that's something that we'll be working on. I mean, that's got to be a huge dollar amount because I, <clears throat> you know, it, when, we, when we built that, it was uh, tons of volunteer labor doing a yep that so. <clears throat> it, it'll it'll most likely be a large price tag you know we'll be working on uh, grant funding um, working with other community groups seeing where we can uh, pull money from uh, hopefully some DNR grants are available for that rebuild uh, but you're right it, it it is a big number mm -hmm. uh, if we if we're gonna replace what's there you know sizable to what's there okay that's all uh, Commissioner Knox, then Commissioner Weber. Uh, two quick questions. If you just clarify, Cullen, Town Square is not a park, it's open space. Is that correct? Correct. All right. or, or a special use facility. Okay. Second question I have is the presentation well done. At the very end, you had the Woodman Center on there. Doesn't necessarily fall under parks and open space. Just curious. It, it doesn't, but we've included some of those types of projects in the past in, in uh, overall parks and open space you know, plan just as, uh, as, as a recreation opportunity. Okay, so it's not, it won't be considered open space or part of a park? Correct. It's a, yeah, it'll be a recreation facility. Thank you. Commissioner Weber? Thank you. 
I don't think there's any question but that uh, the city of Janesville can be very proud of its park and open space system and I, and I think that your folks staff has done a, a really nice job of summarizing what's out there and describing what's what's uh, looking ahead to the future so it's a good document it's a it's a large document and consequently I came up with some questions as I went through it so uh, if if I could Mr. Chairman I've got like five or six questions absolutely it's your right. time thank you um, The other uh, committee member just brought up uh, something about the fact that we have a chart in there that shows, compares us to our peer cities and, and shows that our total park and open space uh, appears to be uh, almost double that of, of um, the average of our peer cities. But I, I think that might be a little bit misleading because we do have, in, in my experience, a lot of open space, a lot of natural areas. Uh, many of our regional parks have large wooded areas. Uh, Schaefer Park up on the northeast side, one of our newer regional parks is almost 100% natural areas. And, and it kind of skews that. When you look just at the numbers, and I, I didn't bring the chart back up, but uh, of, of the Pier Cities, if you look at neighborhood parks and you know active facilities, that disparity is not the same. I think it, it's all there. So I'm a little bit concerned that that chart, the way it's presented, might give the wrong impression to some people that we are uh, uh, overly rich in the amount of space we have. So I don't have a proposed solution to how to how to state that. But if, perhaps if there's some some way that some verbiage could be put in there to clarify that that system. Um, page 46 of the document says that uh, we promote larger neighborhood parks should, uh, and I guess it states that there sh should there be larger but fewer neighborhood parks? And I guess my concern there would be that then the proximity to the neighborhoods would go down if they were larger but more spread apart. So I, I appreciate the fact that it's, easier per acre to maintain a larger park than a bunch of smaller parks. Uh, but um, what about the possibility that you're now going to take these parks, which I think were defined as under what age did you state that the neighborhood parks were to serve? Uh, you, just, just children. Just, yeah, so. OK. Young children, uh, as opposed to adults. Uh, a little bit concerned if we go to just larger parks that we're, we're going to get pretty far separated. So can you address that, please? Sure. And I think, uh, you know, Duane can, can step in, too. Uh, but as part of the um, city's comprehensive plan, it talked about uh, more connective uh, neighborhoods and so sidewalks throughout the, the uh, neighborhoods and um, bike trails and that type of stuff. So. That's what the city has focused on. Um, and so, you know, larger neighborhood parks. And so if you think of Harmony Grove Park or Sandstone Park that have, we've developed in, the, in recent years, the last 15 or 20 years, um, you know, it's, it's a kind of a larger neighborhood than what some of the smaller parks maybe on mm -hmm. the southwest side of the community it, back in the 50s and 60s when that area was growing. Um, you know, there's a lot of small smaller neighborhood parks in that area. So I think as the city grows and it's a connective neighborhood, um, there shouldn't be that concern of, of the playground or the park, the basketball court, whatever it may be, being a little further away for the, the neighborhood kids to get to. Because it's gonna be easier to get to? Because them. it'll be easier to get to. Okay. Thank you. Um, This is just a detail, but on page 58, there's a discussion about Dawson Park and Jeffers Park, and it talks about the possibility of using the area west of Dawson Park for uh, other type recreation improvements, and it specifically mentions the former batting cages. Uh, this plan commission, I think, recommended a council not too far back 
allowing the Boys and Girls Club to acquire that property where the batting gauge is. So uh, I think if we could write in there, I understand there's still some vacant space between the north-south bike trail and the baseball diamonds or softball diamonds. Um, and that is the area that we're really thinking about here. So yep. if we can maybe just drop the term batting cages sure. from the report, that that would make that keep the Boys and Girls Club from thinking we're going to use the property that we agreed to sell to them. Um, page 62, uh, talking about Riverside Park, it makes reference to a natural artesian well there. And uh, I recall some discussion with our former utility director while I was working here about the fact that that Artesian well is is not in any way uh, something that we could certify as being safe or as potable water. So, what is the purpose for having that reference in there? Just that it's a historic element, something to look at but not drink out of? Is that uh, correct? Um, and, and people do drink uh, from it, and when it is running, and it. it it's hit or miss uh, these days of if it is running any water. But um, I think it's just a appreciation of the history of having artesian wells in Riverside Park. There used to be two, and, and the north end was the, was the former wading pool. Um, and this one on the south end is where a lot of people in the area came to get their water. We, we do have the water utility test it, uh, but we don't, we don't market it as a place to come fill your water bottles. So, please just, don't. Just an appreciation of, of the okay. of the historical factor of it. All right. Um, page sixty four discusses that playing fields and other active park features could be located near the northwest corner of Schaefer Park. And uh, I'm aware of the level land in that area behind the houses on Huntington Street, but I'm not aware of any reasonable access point if you were going to make that an active part of the park. I don't know how you could get, for example, a parking area in there to get close to that. What are your thoughts on actually using that and how would you access it? <clears throat> Good question. Um, you're right. It, access would be fairly difficult. We've kept it in the plan uh, because it's been in uh, plans for decades uh, with, with Schaefer Park and Schaefer <clears throat> Park is, is really a, a natural park and um, will someday, will there be fields? Potentially, but um, we, we've just kept that in the Parks and Open Space Plan because it's been in, in other plans throughout the years and there's a possibility of it, but you're right, access would be difficult and uh, you know, what is the what does the future hold for for play fields there i, I don't know i don't know that it's uh, realistic but um, it's definitely something that we continue to have have in the plan just just because would it be reasonable to add some language to the extent that subject to uh dealing with acts finding a uh, acceptable solution to access issues sure just so that's that's clear um, Lions Pond is referred to both as an urban pond as an, an, and as an aquatic facility. And there's a statement in there that under the urban pond section that the water quality has been rated as outstanding. And uh, it's certainly the access for aquatics in Lions Beach is not the same as one of our swimming pools or, or wading pools. Uh, and, and there have been times that we've had to temporarily close the beach because of that. So I'm a little bit concerned about using the term out water quality being rated as outstanding. I, I'm, I'm thinking that it, it was rated as a fishery as outstanding. And I'm wondering if we could simply add that language in the pond section not necessarily the aquatic section that, that, that states that that water quality for fishing 
as a fishery is rated as outstanding. Sure. And leave it at that. Yep. And then finally, the, the trail map you showed us earlier that shows the, the existing trails out there, uh, the one along Highway 14 um, between the main north south shows it turning north, which it does, uh, behind Pine Tree Mall. But when the interstate was rebuilt, we were also able to get that extended through the interchange to Pontiac, right, Dwayne, if I recall? And I, I just think the map could be amended before we finalize the report to show what, where that extends to now that it, that, that it was an important step as part of the interstate what, to take care of getting pedestrian access through that interchange where people used to walk on the gravel shoulder and it wasn't really a safe situation. But I think I'd, it'd be nice if we could show that on the map. Sure. And, and thank you for taking the time to listen to my comments. That would be all that I have. Mr. Markling? I just had a few on the bike trails which are, excuse me, a pretty nice asset and well used. Um, in fact, I'm using them. And so I have a lot of people stop and talk to me about it. So here's the concerns I've heard. And you're probably well aware of all of them, but just so you know, I think it would be very smart to um, do a detailed tour of all the bike trails, making notes of areas that need repaving or regrading um, there are some areas of settling and the uh, asphalt is, is falling apart in certain areas. And while they're doing that, um, it might not be a bad idea to look at some of these uh, homes that back up to the bike trails and the green belts. There's some serious encroachment way past the 20 foot rule on mowing, which I think will um, negate the benefits of having a, a green space out there. And so to be fair to everybody, I think you really need to take a look at um, some of these encroachments that are uh, pretty wild. I'm kind of shocked when they pointed them out to me. Um, also, I think we need to take a look at our restrictions on, on the um, bike trails with the uh, advent of the electric bikes. Um, I'm seeing quite a few electric bikes using it. and. It, it's kind of a gray area, but I think that needs to be addressed. And the other one that I hear quite a bit is uh, we could use more trash receptacles along the way. And I understand picking it up would be hard, but you know, if we put it on a major street, you would just pull over in a pickup and grab it, swap it and go. Um, um, where I walk, I think there's only one and it gets filled up pretty quick. Um, so we usually end up bringing it home when we pick up garbage. And then the other one that somebody pointed out to me, they were lost. <coughs> and so I sent them to the pavilion and there was no map for the local. There's a, a regional um, Ice Age trail map that can take them all the way to Watertown, but it can't tell them where they are in Janesville. Um, I think that would be something fairly simple to do would be to create a map. Here's where you are and the mileage uh, to some of the uh, destination so people could have a good idea where there are and enjoy the bike trails a little bit more. So those were the things that I've heard over the last two years. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Knox. One more quick one. I just want to add on to what Doug mentioned, um, especially on the from Palmer East and, and North, um, the lack of uh, water um, where to stop and, and get a drink of water. If you go Palmer Park and West, there are multiple locations to to do that. Palmer Park and a couple locations, Blackhawk Golf Course um, and a few others as you go towards Monterey. But if you go east and north, uh, there's nothing from a city standpoint from Palmer Park all the way into Milton. So as you're adding that, I've always thought that Kennedy uh, Elementary would be a great spot. But and uh, we are over the over the years we've kind of reduced our drinking fountains just because so many people have bring their own water uh, everywhere they go and so in 2013 it was a budget reduction in a lot of the neighborhood parks and uh, 
a couple other areas as far as reducing the, the number of drinking fountains, and we haven't brought those back online. Uh, but you're right, on the east side, uh, Briarcrest uh, is the only one that comes to mind as for a, for a drinking fountain. Um, we also, with, with the drinking fountains, we get the complaint that, hey, I, I wanted to get a drink of water and I pushed the button and the water's warm and it takes forever for it to cool off and it doesn't taste very good. And it's because the water is stagnant in the lines and it doesn't, you know, you're not using it like you're using it at home. So um, the places where we do have drinking fountains, then people complain about the taste or the fact that it's warm all the time. So, um, you know, we I don't have any problem with them. <laughs> Get rid of them, there's no complaints about the taste. I can attest that they bring their own water because they leave their bottles behind, which is why we need more trash receptacles. Uh, Commissioner Williams, I'll move down to it Commissioner was, Jackson. I just wanted to bring up, I know it was brought up and why the Woodman Sports Complex is on here, but, um, and I understand your explanation on that, but Oak Hill Cemetery, uh, parks, open space, and recreation. Um, um, my feeling on it um, is that Oak Hill Cemetery, even though it's under the Parks Department, should be moved to a different category and, and not be under parks and, and open space. It's a, a place for respect. I was up there the other day and um, didn't say anything, but here was a father and his son playing baseball right by where the graves were that that's they got Riverside Park right down the road um, I don't understand why Oak Hill Cemetery is is in our parks and and wrecks is that included also in how much parkland we have the Oak Hill it Cemetery? is <clears throat> she was shaking her head no when you said it is oh. <laughs> <laughs> It's in the special use facilities, okay. but not, not in the overall acreage. But it, is it really, I mean, I don't know what your definition of special use is, and I guess it's because it's used as a cemetery, um, but should it really be used for, should we promote it as some place for recreation? Sure. Yeah, I guess it's all in how you, how you view it and... Um, I think we've included it here because the parks division oversees it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess it's how you view it if you have uh, parents and grandparents buried there, as far as you want somebody to be there yeah. as recreation, or you want it to be a place of respect. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't disagree uh, with that. And it's like I said, it's we included it in this edition because um, because the parks division oversees it. So, mm -hmm. but. Just my two cents. I think it should be split off, but that's just for me. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Jackson. When uh, we had our debate discussion concerning the Woodman Center, one of the issues that drove that was there was little to do for teenagers, young people in our city. When I look at the parks, and I enjoy our city parks, when I look at them, I see a lot of things for children uh, other than uh, maybe the softball fields. What do we have for that area between uh, children and the bike trails, the young adults, et cetera? What do we specifically target teens for teens? Uh, well, I think the mountain bike area at um, Palmer Park uh, will get a lot of use from teens. I've already seen uh, in, the, in the last year since we've had some of the trails out there being heavily used by, by uh, the teenage population. Um, you know, we, we have uh, some of the other programming that recreation does uh, for the teens can take part in. Um, everything's not just for uh, the younger, younger children. Um, you know, they, they can always play pickleball or tennis. There's teenagers that are playing tennis and, and those types of sports. Uh, you know, if they're involved in it in school. Um, and, and pickleball is increasing through all age levels, not just, uh, not just seniors. Um, so uh, I think there is stuff for, for the teenage population to do. Um, I see a lot of teenage population playing soccer out at Rockport, which 
I think we sh should look at doing something different or to help them out too. Have we looked at a skateboard park? We have one. We, we, we have, have a skateboard one? park at, at Bond Park. Uh, we have basketball courts, you know, that are heavily used by the, the teen population. I wasn't aware we had a skateboard park, you say at Bond? Mm -hmm. Yep, Bond Park. I think I'll just kind of interrupt. I think, Colin, if you wanted to, you could probably sit here for an hour saying <laughs> all the different activities we could do, but there's definitely activities there if they choose to, right? Correct. Yeah, endless. So. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions for staff? All right. Then I will open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak, please move over to the lectern over there, state your name and address, and let's hear what you have to say. Okay. Anyone wishing to speak? Last chance. All right, public hearing is closed. What are the wishes? I move that we adopt um, resolution number 2020, no, that's not it. Oh, adopting the 2024 2029 park and open space plan as a component of the city's comprehensive plan, plan commission resolution number 2024 02. And do we forward that to the city council with a positive recommendation? Is that part of it? Okay. Yeah. Right. Motion motion by Williams. Financial aspects. Okay. Second by Commissioner Jackson. Uh, we need to add to that we do we did not review the financial aspects of this. Duly really noted there. So commission or motion by Commissioner Williams. Second by Commissioner Jackson. Anything further, Commissioner Williams? No, thank you. Right. Anything further? All right. Let's vote. I don't think everyone's in, so we'll have to do a voice vote. Okay, Commissioner Jackson. Yes. Commissioner Williams. Yes. Commissioner Knox. Yes. Commissioner Weber. Yes. Commissioner Boskell is absent. Commissioner Udell. Yes. And Commissioner Markline. Yes. Uh, the motion is unanimously carried and approved. Okay. Gentlemen are here for item number two. That'd be my next bit. Which uh, which item are you guys here for? We'll we'll right. view. Say that again. The right road. Right well, there we go. Let's go backwards in order here. I'll go to item number two: public hearing on the conditional use permit to establish a two-family dwelling at 805 North Right Road. Uh, Trey, the field is yours. All right. Good evening, Plan Commission. Trey Meyer, Associate Planner. John Rumpel, on behalf of property owner Markham Creek Properties, LLC, has submitted a conditional use permit request to construct a two-family dwelling at 805 North Wright Road. You can see the subject property outlined in yellow on the map on your screen. The property is located on the northwest corner of the intersection of North Wright Road and Parkview Drive. This lot has remained vacant since it was originally platted in 1968. The subject lot and surrounding area are zoned R1 and construction of two family dwellings require conditional use review and approval by the Planning Commission as a result of this zoning designation. The applicant is requesting to construct a side by side duplex. The lot is approximately 85 feet by 130 feet and as proposed the site plan would meet all zoning requirements for lot size, green space, open space as well as off street parking. You can see the proposed building elevations here. The proposed exterior materials include brick veneer wainscot on the front elevation and shake siding on the gables. Vinyl lap siding and asphalt shingle cover the remaining building faces. Each residential unit would be approximately 1170 square feet and include two bedrooms, one and three quarter baths, a first floor laundry and a two car garage. As noted in the uh, staff memorandum, uh, the review criteria for two family dwellings are generally satisfied uh, for this project. Um, staff believe th the request demonstrates compliance with the applicable criteria for a conditional use permit as well as two family dwelling construction and recommends the plan commission approve of the request following a public hearing. Staff did complete the requisite public notices for the request and have not been contacted regarding the proposed development. And lastly, I would note that there are uh, a couple of representatives of the property owner in attendance this evening who can answer questions you may have for them and I can certainly answer any questions you may have for city staff. Uh, questions for Trey? Commissioner Markline? <clears throat> I personally own the property across um, on Parkview Drive and I will be abstaining from conversation and voting on this issue. 
thank you for letting us know. Any other questions for Trey? Uh, seeing none, I'll open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak, again, come up to the lectern and state your name and address for the record. Okay. Anyone wishing to speak? Last chance. All right. Public hearing is closed. Commissioner Weber. I move to find that the proposed development is compliant with the standards for conditional use approval as prescribed by the Janesville Zoning Ordinance and approve a conditional use permit to establish a two-family dwelling at 805 North Wright Road, subject to the conditions listed in Section 1. Motion made by Commissioner Weber, second by Commissioner Knox. Anything further? I just think it's a very good use of a empty lot that's been there for a long time and appears to be very compatible with the other types of uh, homes that are in the neighborhood, including other duplexes. And, and for that reason, I support it. Commissioner Knox? Yeah, great infill opportunity. And I played baseball there as a kid. And I'm glad to see it being used <laughs> rather than that. So good luck on your project if it passes. Voice vote, please. Okay, Commissioner Jackson. Yes. Commissioner Williams. Yes. Commissioner Knox. <laughs> yes. Commissioner Weber. Yes. Commissioner Vosco is absent. Commissioner Udell. Yes. And Commissioner Markline. Abstain. The motion carries uh, five in support. Good luck. And moving on to our final item of old business, public hearing, ordinance repealing and amending the B2 community shopping district regulations affecting vacant gasoline service stations in chapter 42 zoning of the code of general ordinances of the city of Janesville, file ordinance number 2024-890. Uh, thank you, I'll handle this. Dwayne Chair, planning director for the city. Uh, as you can see in the staff report, uh, at the direction of the city manager's office, the planning division has prepared uh, file ordinance 2024-890. That is an ordinance that would repeal and renumber, or in other, in other words, uh, amend the B2 community shopping district regulations that uh, address or affect uh, vacant gasoline service stations within the community. The uh, provision in the ordinance is a longstanding provision, uh, but it essentially uh, requires the, uh, the applicant or, or requester, could be a property owner, um, <clears throat> that has filed a request to establish or construct a new gasoline service station uh, who also happens to own or control uh, an existing vacant or abandoned uh, gas station elsewhere in the community within the last 36 months uh, of that being abandoned to um, submit what is referred to as a complete plan for reuse of that former gas station. The, um, the ordinance, however, does not define what that complete plan consists of or would need to include. It's a provision that uh, was included in the carried over from the ordinance prior to the 1981 adoption of the code. So it, it's dated. And uh, in staff's research of the, uh, the genesis of, of that provision, we're uncertain as to the intent. Um, but it remains in the code. And as a, uh, a provision in the code, it needs to be applied when it's triggered based upon the conditional use permit review of a new gasoline service station, if in fact it's determined that the requester, the applicant, uh, uh, also happens to own an abandoned gas station uh, within the past 36 months. Not certain as to the magic uh, or relevance necessarily of the 36 months or three years, but uh, that is nonetheless in the code. The <clears throat> The only time that staff is aware that this was triggered was with the recent review of the Quick Trip uh, gas, uh, gas and convenience store facility on the former uh, Rock County Job Center at 1900 Center Avenue. In that instance, the, uh, the applicant Quick Trip also owned the, uh, the vacant stop and go gas station at 1804 East Milwaukee Street, which had closed sometime after the East Milwaukee Street uh, quick trip uh, had opened roughly 
a uh, little over two and a half years ago, I believe. The, the request before you uh, with file ordinance 890 is to remove that provision. Uh, staff supports the removal and uh, not only because we're trying to remove, uh, I guess, provision that lacks clarity in the code, but we have several other state and local ordinances that we believe effectively get at abandoned uh, gas stations or vacant properties that deals with a, a number of local codes that address maintenance for such properties, state codes that address closed gas stations, removal of underground tanks that uh, must occur under those regulations. And, um, and then finally, if there is a, a vacant uh, property that formerly housed a gas station, the, the zoning ordinance requires a, uh, a number of things to be satisfied before that existing property could be re reopened for a gas station or repurposed for another use. They would have to prepare a site plan to ensure local compliance with zoning provisions, building code regulations, fire code requirements, um, and any other applicable city code. So as a result, uh, you know, staff prepared the draft ordinance. We are uh, recommending that the uh, plan commission support a recommendation uh, for council adoption of this ordinance. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions you may have in that regard. Any questions for Dwayne? Commissioner Williams? So a stop it for a quick trip has given the city a complete plan on what they're going to do with the Milwaukee Street? Yes, yeah, so in the, ins in the instance of 1804 East Milwaukee Street, and plan the plan commission has, in the last five years, reviewed four <coughs> uh, proposals for a new quick trip gas and convenience store. That was the only one of the four that triggered this, uh, this provision. In that circumstance, uh, the Quick Trip in particular has a, a, a corporate, I think, policy and uh, approach to when, it, when an existing station under their ownership closes, they go and they remove the tanks, they remove the canopy, they remove all signage pertaining to the former gas station use, and um, then the dispensing pumps. They essentially reposition the property for future commercial use by way of doing so. In, in that instance, they provided staff with a um, letter description of those activities, when they were performed, how they're marketing the site, what they intend to um, repurpose it for, and so on and so forth. That was included um, in the staff report analysis section of the, uh, the conditional use review that the, pl the plan commission uh, review, reviewed roughly two months ago and approved. And so they, for lack again of definition in the code, we believe that that satisfied the requirements of a plan for reuse um, just based on what the description provided and the existing condition on the site. Well, the tank removal is, is state code, right? I mean. there Yes, yeah. so the uh, uh, Wisconsin Department of Ag Trade and Consumer Protection has the, uh, the authority to require testing and removal. The city of Janesville also has adopted locally under chapter 16, <coughs> the, uh, the inspection component and tank removal component to reinforce the state statute or state <coughs> uh, administrative code in that regard. I find it interesting that this was the first time that it was in recent history that it's been used, but also <clears throat> I don't understand how we could enforce it because it says if the applicant had owned within the last 36 months, well, if they sold it, how they know what's going to happen to it? How, how can that person that's applying that used to own the abandoned gas station yeah. tell you what's going to be done to it? So <coughs> I, I, I don't see a problem with what's being recommended. Mr. Merklin? If it was the opposite, if we were adding this as a new uh, requirement, I'd be all over it. The fact that it was on our books and we never used it and we're repealing and I'm all for it. And I think as you go through this uh, rezoning uh, review uh, for the new comprehensive plan, I think you're gonna find more of these that are redundant or archaic and I encourage you to remove those as well. Thank you. 
Richard Jackson? I move to oh, forward oh, a oh, hold on. public hearing. Oh, public I'm hearing sorry, I didn't. Any other commissions for staff? <laughs> Duane? <laughs> I will open the public hearing. Anyone wishing? Just city staff in there. But anyone wishing to speak? And the public hearing is closed. Commissioner Jackson, you have something to say? <laughs> Thank you for your uh, patience. I move to forward a favorable recommendation to the City Council to amend <laughs> the B2 Community Shopping District regulations affecting vacant gasoline service stations as provided in file ordinance number 2024-890. Commissioner Williams, a second? Commissioner Jackson, anything further? No. Commissioner Williams? Nothing. Okay. Let's uh, vote, please. Commissioner Jackson? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Commissioner Knox? Yes. Commissioner Weber? Yes. Commissioner Voskel is absent. Commissioner Udell? Yes. And Commissioner Markline? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Item number six, new business. There is none tonight. Let's move down to item number seven, the director's report. Uh, yes, thank you. Just a couple um, announcements this evening. Uh, the City Council at their meeting of April 8th uh, approved the final plan of the Ridges of Rock County, plat number three. That was a, um, a replat that uh, basically reconfigured the dimensional uh, aspects of, I think, 15 lots in that subdivision on the far north side of the city. Uh, secondly, on April 25th, um, the city of Janesville is excited to return back to the in-person volunteer recognition program for uh, volunteer uh, appreciation and awards that will occur next week, Thursday, April 25th at 3.30 in the program room at the Hedberg Public Library. And uh, I, I believe the city has more than 600 volunteers and, and certainly all city volunteers uh, from the various uh, city boards, commissions, and committees are invited to uh, that event. And speaking of um, commission members, uh, this evening marks the last plan commission meeting for three of our uh, commission members, specifically Andy Udell, Carl Weber, and uh, Steve Knox. Uh, each of you have served two full three-year terms or six years on the commission. Um, I guess on behalf of the city of Janesville, I would like to extend my sincere appreciation for your efforts over the last six years. The, uh, the commission has reviewed uh, a number of projects, grown uh, substantially uh, in, in various sectors, especially in the industrial manufacturing realm and, and through various commercial redevelopments. You have attended, um, if I do the math correctly, uh, you know, up to 24 meetings each year. That's, that's 144 meetings. That doesn't include your work at all the separate meetings for the comprehensive plan update. Uh, serving in the capacity of the steering committee. It doesn't include all of the neighborhood meetings that are scheduled for uh, prior to uh, development projects. Um, it doesn't reflect the time you spent reading all of our reports and preparation of these meetings. But with all of that, uh, I, I would like to thank you and appreciate the, the guidance and the direction that uh, you have provided over the last six years because it, it, it makes a difference. Um, tonight, for example, with the Parks and Open Space Plan, um, you ask great questions, you read the documents, you make the plan better, you're, you're, you're concerned about the city's future and make uh, for wonderful uh, uh, volunteers in that regard. And so with that, um, we'll miss you, planning staff will miss, miss you in that regard and uh, the commission will, will move on, but we appreciate those efforts, so thank you. Can't wait to see you do the math on uh, Doug's meetings in time. <laughs> <laughs> so. A question, is the two th terms state or city? I believe imposed? that's under a city, yeah, city policy. Uh, item number eight, plan commission announcements. Mr. Markline? I too would like to echo um, Dwayne's thing that coming as a citizen to thank um, my colleagues here as citizens who stepped forward to uh, improve our city 
and you've been to some meetings where we've had overflow. Hmm. You've had many meetings where we talked to an empty room. They all matter. And um, it wasn't for the seven of us. A lot of things wouldn't be getting done. So I appreciate your input and your advice and your uh, criticisms as we went forward over the last six years. It's been appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. You guys have nothing but my respect. I'd like to say thank you to, to all the service that you've put in. And Carl, you've always had some good input. I've appreciated that. I wish you could stay on longer. Andy, you've been helpful and brought me some new insight. And Steve, well, it's Steve. Hey, now, come on. I <laughs> uh, appreciate you all. Before Commissioner Williams cry, I think we should uh, adjourn. <laughs> we are adjourned. All right.